Part 1. You'll hear a conversation between Alan and Gianna, the office counsellor of a company. First, you have some time to read questions 1 to 6. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 6. What's up, Gianna? You look like you're in bad shape. Yes, maybe I'll get sick leave from the boss and finally catch up on some sleep. I've barely eaten and slept in days. Those are warning signs of occupational stress. How are things at work? Terrible. After all the layoffs lately, the workload is totally overwhelming for everyone that's left. So I spend every waking moment in the office. I'm kept busy all the time. So you need to take a few minutes break every so often to clear and refresh your mind. But my boss will complain I'm not hard working. She's so capricious that you can't predict her reaction sometimes. Maybe your boss just doesn't have a clue about how much you're really doing. Keep her updated on your achievements and projects. Also insist that she prioritise everything so you can manage your time better. That's right. I suppose that would help me regain some sense of control. But I'm afraid that she'll take that as a sign of laziness and give me the axe. So take the initiative and hit the job hunting trail now. You'll be surprised at how many opportunities are out there. Well, that's encouraging. Anyway, you should cheer up and get rid of the situation. You know, according to a survey, about 40% of all people find their work very stressful and 25% develop mental or physical diseases. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 7 to 10. So serious? I didn't know that. How do the problems start? You know, they start when conflicts at work induces stress. Your body reacts by flooding the bloodstream with hormones that tense up your muscles and increase your blood pressure. This is meant to save you in a fight-or-flight situation but leads to a host of illnesses, ranging from insomnia and headaches to heart attacks, when it occurs regularly over an extended period of time. What should I do to prevent such things happening? Well, most occupational stress is attributed to a recognised lack of control. You should act in advance to relieve the problems. For example, you should actively pursue career opportunities rather than quietly worry about getting fired. Of course, you can't control everything, so you need to help your mind and body cope. Keep a journal to release your frustrations, take short walks to calm down, or if necessary, simply take a mental health day. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear part of a lecture on art and culture in the Indonesian island of Bali. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Last week, we looked at the traditional art of Japan. In this week's lecture, we're going to move south and look at the very special way in which art has developed in the beautiful island of Bali, which is now part of Indonesia. I'll begin by giving you a brief historical overview. It's thought that the first inhabitants of Bali were farmers who arrived around 3000 BC, at the beginning of the Iron Age. They probably originally came from China, and in Bali they cultivated rice and built temples ornamented with wood and stone carvings and statues. The Hindu religion was introduced in the 14th century AD, and this has remained the main religion on the island. This was an important period in the artistic development of the island, when sculptors, poets, priests and painters worked together in the service of the ruling families. Rather than painting everyday scenes, artists concentrated on narrative paintings illustrating the epic stories of Hinduism. Bali's rich natural resources have always made it an alluring goal for merchants, and from the 17th century onwards, Dutch ships visited the island to trade in spices and luxury goods. Gradually, the old royal families lost their power, and eventually, in 1906, the Dutch East Indies Company was founded, and the island became a colony. In the 20th century, art then took on a very different role, as a tool accessible to everyone in the fight of the Balinese people against colonization, rather than as the property of a minority. Shortly after this, in the 1920s, stories of the beauty of the island of Bali began to spread around the world, and Balinese art underwent another vast transformation with the advent of tourism to the island. At first, this was only on a small scale, but it had important effects. Expatriate artists from Holland and Germany settled on the island, bringing paper, Chinese ink and other new materials with them. They worked with local artists, encouraging them to experiment with concepts like naturalism, expressionism, light and perspective, as well as to move away from the traditional focus on narrative painting towards something closer to their own experience. When independence came in 1945, this desire for an art to match a new national identity became stronger and the traditional narrative paintings started to give way to scenes showing the everyday life of the Balinese people, harvests, market scenes and daily tasks, as well as the myths and legends of their history. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Many of the features that give this art its special place in the world today can be traced back to these historical roots. One feature that is rooted in the events of the last century is that today in Bali the production and the appreciation of art is not restricted to a minority. In fact, there is a famous saying that in Bali everyone is an artist. And it's not considered that to make art or talk about art, any formal training is needed. Art is just produced as part of Balinese life. Even fruit salad is served with flowers strewn on top. 
One factor which has contributed to this productivity is barley's fertility. Over the centuries, the rich soil and the fact that food and shelter are readily available has given the islanders the leisure to develop their arts. While painting, sculpture, carving, and music have traditionally been the province of men, women have channeled their creative energy into making lavish offerings to the gods with spectacular pyramids of flowers, fruit, and cakes offered at the temples on festival days and celebrations. All these kinds of art still have close links with the religion of the people and are something that people do on a daily basis. Another special characteristic of art in Bali is that it is not generally seen as an individual pursuit. In the West, art is often carried out by the artist on his own, reflecting his own individual world view in the hope of achieving personal wealth and fame. For Balinese artists, art is something that's done as a group, and many artists may participate in one piece of work. And Balinese art is not restricted to temples and offerings. It decorates objects such as jackets, motorcycles, hotel menus, and so on. But perhaps the most significant characteristic of Balinese art, and one that distinguishes it most from the art of the West, is to do with its expected lifespan. Carvings are made in soft stone, which is gradually destroyed over the years. The humid climate rots paper and cloth paintings. The magnificent offerings of fruit and sweets are eaten. Wooden statues are destroyed by insects. But Balinese artists accept that their work is ephemeral, not permanent, and instead of slavishly preserving the originals, they produce new art. And all this rebuilding, renovating, and replacing means that the island's art continually evolves and perpetuates itself. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation on animal protection. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Thanks for joining us today, Mike. How did Baja California become a consideration for a condor release? Our recovery plan for California condors requires us to re-establish the birds in as much as their former range as possible. Baja, being the southernmost recent range for the California condor, works well in that they were only recently lost from the area. Mid 1930s, and considerable habitat still remains. It is very isolated, with very few people in the area. The mountains are spectacular, ranging up to 10,000 feet, or 3,000 meters. Our selected release site is at nearly 8,000 feet, 2,400 meters. Mike, how many birds do you envision flying free in this area, Baja, in the future? We will be releasing four to eight birds on a yearly basis, and will reconsider the situation when we have twenty birds in the area. What age do the birds have to be before moving them? That's a good question. Typically, we move them at eight months to eighteen months old. Birds are ready to fledge or leave from the nest at six to seven months of age. In our current release group in Baja, we have birds as old as thirty months. It will be interesting to see how they behave. I expect that they will want to range more than younger birds and make it challenging for us to keep up. 
Is there a maximum number of birds a certain area can support? Yes, it's called the carrying capacity for any area, for any species. In our case, our strategy to find that number is to saturate the environment to a level where we determine that the birds are showing difficulty either in finding food, behaviorally, or in survivorship. That level is greatly determined by the availability of food in the area and nesting possibilities. Now look at questions 26 to 30. As the talk continues, answer questions 26 to 30. What do you hope to accomplish with this release in the long run? I expect that well within 10 years the condors will be flying north and joining birds already released in Southern California. Hopefully we will reach at least 150 birds in each of these populations within about 15 years. What would you say is the biggest contribution to the California condor program's success? That would have to be the fact that we were able to breed the birds in captivity from the 27 birds we started with in 1987 to the 205 birds we have today. This is thanks to cooperation between the San Diego Wild Animal Park, the Los Angeles Zoo, and the World Center for Birds of Prey in Bois, Idaho. Are there any problems keeping track of and protecting your released animals outside of the US? Nope. We are using radio transmitters and will be using the new satellite and GPS transmitters as well. Which system is better? Using satellites. The advantages over radio telemetry are numerous. It makes it possible to keep up with the bird's flight without being led miles in a matter of minutes. It took the young condor only a week to migrate across the state, and with just radio telemetry, poor weather can keep a plane grounded, and not all roads are accessible to track them on ground. New technology will allow one to be able to track birds that are not accessible by plane. Also, it is a new way to gauge the effectiveness of reintroduction. How so? If a condor transmitter works properly, researchers will get a location every 10 days for about two years. Do you see an end in sight for the need to breed condors in captivity? Yes, that would be great. But it will take a while for us to establish the two wild populations and make sure that they are sustainable. Part of our recovery is to maintain a captive flock of 150 birds in various zoos around the country as a safety net for the future. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture on cities of the future. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 37.
Okay, we've been looking at how societies will develop in the future and at the increase in the size of cities. So, I want to talk to you today about the key considerations in these cities of the future. There are three key elements I want to look at, and these are the new features they will have, issues of size, and the main problems to be considered. First of all, individual transportation will be a big factor in these new megacities as public transport becomes unmanageable. There'll be a huge rise in the use of segways, which are personal transporters, like motorized scooters. As a result, and partly also to reduce pollution, roads will be altered so that they are narrower and will take up less of a city's space than they do currently. Naturally, this is a major change to the infrastructure, and something that may hinder it is the huge amount of investment it will require. The next thing is, what is going to happen to the commercial areas? We do not want these to become even larger concrete jungles than they are at present, so we have to look at design. And current designs for city development include building gardens on the roofs of these buildings to make a more pleasant environment for workers. And you may think that these areas will expand to cope with increased commercial activity. In fact, the prediction is that they will cover one-fifth of the area that they do at present as we build upwards. The exception to this is shopping centres, which we predict will expand with more and more temperature-controlled malls. What may cause difficulties is that the superstores will be confined to the outer edges of the city, as they will be too big to fit into the new malls. Then, of course, there are the residential areas, and these will undergo their own changes. One particular development will be houses which are built from glass, as innovations in this material allow it to provide light without causing problems with temperature inside a building. The residential areas will not be allowed to expand without limit, as happens in some areas at present, and their size will be restricted to a population of 15,000. One issue which has yet to be resolved, and I'm not sure it ever will be, is how we manage to house older residents. They will be increasing in numbers as time goes on. Finally, how will these cities live? We know we have limited energy sources, so what will we do? Well, something currently in development, which will be a feature, is that waste is going to become an energy source. For example, to provide gas in homes. Also, as new technology and systems are developed, we will find that energy plants will become smaller. Another energy source we could use, but one which raises issues of having enough space and too much noise, is wind farms. Because of the problems, I'm not convinced these will be the grand solution to our energy problems that we thought they were going to be. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 38 to 40. Now, moving on to looking at the social aspect of cities, we need to look at housing and how people will live. Cities currently have flats in the centre, populated by single people and wealthier residents, and families tend to move to the outskirts. In the future, the centre of cities will see a dramatic change. We will see many more examples of cooperative buildings. This is where people join together to form a company that owns the building they live in. And despite continuing shortages, there will also be a rise in the provision of retirement homes in city centres so that the elderly can have easy access to hospitals and shops. Recently, we have seen a levelling off in the growth of private housing, and I think that will not change. 
But we are likely to see more social housing, as far fewer people will be able to afford to own their own homes. OK, now, if anybody has... Any that is the end of part four. Check your answers. Thank mm -hmm. you.